Hello, hello, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Swelling. Um, welcome to our uh, Leadership speak se Speaker Series. Thank you all for being here again. The Global Leadership se uh, Speaker Series is an initiative uh, from the Center for Global Partnerships and Learning and the Associated Dean's Office. This event will focus on a myriad of topics that impact leadership in the global space. And the events are from April to June. So we are uh, almost, uh, almost in the middle of uh, all our sessions. Before we start, I'd like to share uh, some information about our center. The Center for Global Partnerships and Learning provides GSEP students with the various services ranging from publication support, certificate programs, access to the GSEP academic journal, uh, the Scholarship Without Borders, and a few other services such as cultural celebrations, info sessions, and workshops. Now, let me introduce you to our panel moderator, uh, Dr. Wena Shane. Dr. Wena Lee Shane is a third generation Korean descendant born and raised in, raised in China. She immigrated to the US in 2012. She is a clinical assistant professor at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University. Her teaching and research including, include learning, design, and technologies, language learning, international students, and leadership in teaching. Thank you, Dr. Chena, for being here and for accepting our invitation for being our moderator today. Thank you, Solan. Um, so I guess it's my turn to introduce all the panelists. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, being with us on a Tuesday night. It feels like a Monday, right? Um, thank you for being here and wanting to learn more global leadership perspectives from everyone. And I'm very honored to be invited as a moderator. Uh, and I do want to introduce everyone uh, according to their bios, but I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves uh, a little bit after my introduction. So um, I will start with Dr. Hania. Thank you for being here, Dr. Hania. So um, I will read the bio. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hania is an assistant professor in learning technologies at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University. She has many years of experience designing, implementing, evaluating, and researching e-learning practices, both in small and large scale learning environments, such as MOOCs. Her research interests focus on humanizing education practices through digital transformation and innovative pedagogies to foster mastery learning for all learners. To achieve this goal, she examines user experience, instructional models, and learning behaviors in different online courses and e-learning platforms concerning learner differences. Her research has been published in well-known national and international journals, books, and conference proceedings such as uh, ACM, e-learning and digital media, Routledge, and uh, IGI Global. Uh, and I will finish introducing our panelists first. I will let you to introduce uh, one by one after that. And we have Shada, uh, my previous student. <laughs> so Shada is the founder of uh, Importality. I got that right. Sustainable consultancy. Once I first saw these to manage end-to-end -end integration projects, EAI, for the Saudi Central Bank, with a focus on green strategies and initiatives, and the leader for the first Saudi financial inclusion study, a social entrepreneur who challenges the status quo for positive disruption and innovation. Welcome, Shada. And Thank we you. have Yun Sun. Um, he's a student of PhD in Global Leadership and Change at Pepperdine University. He currently participates in some organizations such as Secretary General of eBook and eLibrary Africa UN Partnership Program, Head uh, Vice President of Dawson An Chang Ho Memorial Foundation of Americas, and is also the CEO of Soben Education Foundation of America, Soben Education. Welcome, Yang Sun. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. And lastly, we have Pete uh, Tollis. P 
Pete Tolles is the director of the business programs and assistant professor at the Hellenic American University, HAU, in Athens, Greece. Before moving to academia, Pete worked for global organizations like Viz Explorer, MGM Resource International, and the Cosmopol sorry, Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas. And I'm going to try to pronounce his name is uh, Panayote. <laughs> close, close, Panayote. Oh. But Pete's easy for everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having All right. Me. So welcome again. Yeah. Thank you for being here. So Dr. Hania, do you want to start us off, introduce a little bit about more about yourself and your where you're from and um, your relationship with Pepperdine? Yeah. Don't forget to unmute. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for the great introduction. And and um, nice meeting you all. Some of you, uh, you know, I had in previous classes, some of you are new to me. So nice meeting you all. Uh, as Dr. Chen mentioned, I'm assistant professor at Pepperdine. I teach courses on learning design, e-learning theories, and uh, learning in general in technology, how they intersect. Um, I'm originally from Palestine, and I have been here for more than 20 years here in the US. I was uh, before that in Illinois, and then I moved here to California. So, uh, this is my second year actually at Pepperdine, <laughs> moving to California. So it's a big jump from Illinois. <laughs> it's like really snowy and coming here to California. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here. So let's see. Thank you, Dr. Hania. And we have um, Beyonce next. Yeah, good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I think I'm not an, uh, the best person who represent, uh, represent Korean uh, culture or so on, but uh, I was willing to join to this group. And I'm from South Korea originally. And um, I was a minister for 20 years in Korea and the Philippines. And I work for a private school in Korea. And uh, when I moved to the United States, I'm making an education company. And then I tried to make an uh, international school in South Korea. Actually, today I have some delegates from a local government of South Korea uh, negotiating a polytechnic school, um, especially with the Caltech in Pasadena. So I just uh, 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 came here to sit here for like two hours and I need to join again to the group. So uh, I'm enjoying um, studying at Pepperdine University. Typically, I mean, I have three professors here, Dr. Uh, Miramonte and uh, Hania and then Dr. Chen. I mean, uh, I, I'm so busy and then um, I'm on only one Asian in my cohort, but uh, professors so encourage me. Typically. And then also I love my cohort members, my colleagues, they always encourage me to come together. So that's a very different uh, uh, environment of education in uh, compared to South Korea. So I enjoy and thank you so much for inviting me again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gansan. Shata. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll also start with thank you for the invite. Um, so uh, I'm uh, first. I'm almost done actually with my first year with the PhD with Pepperdine. Um, uh, so uh, I think you've already made the introduction, but I'll give you a little bit of a uh, more about myself. So um, I was born actually in Seattle, Washington, and uh, we. I did my early year in 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 America, and we moved back to Saudi. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I did my studies in Saudi. I worked um, uh, mainly in the IT and uh, innovation kind of industry, moving slowly to strategy uh, and uh, kind of global strategy, I would say, in terms of uh, my interest, uh, which also led me to join Pepperdine. Um, I'm currently based uh, in uh, UAE, Dubai, uh, but I've been I think now, I think I, I operate on maybe five time zones, including LA, New York, 
Riyadh and Dubai right now. Uh, sometimes uh, Asia, Singapore. So, uh, and it's 4.30, actually 4.45 a.m. where I am now. So just to keep in mind where, <laughs> which zone I'm working on. Uh, I'm, I look forward to this session. Thank you so much, Shada. Thank you for letting us know what time zone you're at. I was going to type, like, everyone should talk about their time zone. <laughs> and thank you for being here this early. Yeah. Last but not least, Pete. Well, hi, everyone. Good morning for me, too. I'm in Athens, Greece, so it's 3.30 in the morning. I'm about an hour behind you. Uh, a little bit about me, quite a little similar uh, background. I grew up in Long Beach, California to Greek parents. Uh, lived in Long Beach until my high school years, then I moved to Las Vegas. And while in Las Vegas, I went to UNLV for my undergraduate in marketing and my MBA in the executive MBA program, but working through casinos. Uh, the last, let's say, seven years, I was director of a consulting firm for a startup software company. And that got me into going to Pepperdine for my PhD in global leadership and change. I think uh, you know the three of us are like somewhat slightly different within our path, uh, but we're all going to get there eventually. Um, I'm currently finishing my dissertation, and the topic is in uh, the perspective, strategies, leadership approaches, and policy approaches for sustainable tourism development by municipal leaders in Greece, the Hellenic Republic, and. Uh, like I said, I came out to Greece actually about a year ago to be the director of business program at the Atlantic American University, uh, which is a, an American style college in Greece, which has a very different higher education system. But we also have a campus in New Hampshire. And I also still work in casinos slightly as a consultant back in the US. So good morning for me. And uh, sorry if I have a little bit of a delay as I respond because I just waking up again. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Um, welcome everyone uh, one more time and thank you Sulan to have such a you know a rich group with our cultures and nationalities and origins of our birth and our experiences and it's such an exciting uh, event um, you know before the session started <laughs> uh, we had a little conversation Byung Sun was talking about oh I you know I prepare more right I was like this is very interesting and I'm going to use that for intro like you can tell already different leadership or even just personality <laughs> style um, between people who are from Asian countries despite how successful they are you know Beyonce is like the quietest students I've ever seen so cannot wait to hear more about uh, everyone and what you uh, would like to share uh, regarding today's topic so let's start with our first question. Um, first question is, what are the main cultural differences you perceive between the US and your country? And especially now everyone's living in both cultures, uh, both countries. So that'll be um, very interesting to hear. Uh, and for audience, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put on the chat box um, as we go, right? So we don't have any particular order. If you want to take that question, feel free to um, unmute and talk, yeah. Um, I can go first if you Yes, please. Um, so actually, it's an interesting question about culture. Like um, when we, we talk about culture, we, we kind of think about like, um, ideas, uh, ideologies, religion, kind of um, uh, practices or kind of uh, values, right? Um, if I'm going to simplify it and look at my experience, um, there's a lot of, like, if I'm going to, uh, specifically American culture versus Saudi culture, you would see like kind of American culture is kind of more, it's very out there. So you will see a lot of people very familiar with it, right? We are very familiar kind of with the, um, let's say simply things like uh, the Hollywood and the movie, um, the food, for example, the whole idea of the fast food kind, you know, these are these are things that kind of um, uh, broadcasted, uh, broadcasted to the whole world. Um, and when I'm talking about Saudi specifically, I feel like um, uh, if I can compare like, 
in many in, in many senses, you know a lot about American culture, but I don't think the on the other side, which is American culture, know a lot about Saudi, for example. So, um, if if I'm going to give like a a general idea about the culture, so uh, Saudi is um, a monarchy. Okay, it's uh, it's ruled by the uh, the Sa uh, the Al Saud family, uh, and it's. Um, heavily rooted with the Islamic kind of uh, culture and values and uh, Sharia laws. Uh, saying that, um, the recent years, uh, Saudi has gone through a transformational and reform uh, through the, uh, the new vision of the leadership. Um, how does that reflect on culture? Um, uh, it is based on this very deep kind of pride and root of culture, of Saudi culture, but it also kind of embodies or embraces this new kind of globalization and kind of uh, being out there and uh, um, in the forefront of, of the world. So, kind of, when I'm, so when I take, uh, when I talk about today's culture, Saudi culture, I feel like there's a lot of, um, uh, emphasis on sharing this culture and kind of uh, 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 putting it up front for, to everybody to see the real side, the rather than kind of the stereotype that you have been seeing throughout the years, you know, uh, and it's usually from one kind of sided kind of vision of uh, being kind of this oil kind of uh, uh, oil country that living in the desert or kind of riding camels. Now the image of Saudi, a culture is about family. It's about um, uh, hospitality. It's about uh, leisure. It's about uh, the going back to nature. You, you will no longer see the images of the sand. You're gonna see mountains. You're gonna see uh, snow. You're gonna see uh, beaches. So uh, I think that's kind of um, this new kind of culture is emerging with the kind of exposure of this new kind of reform of what's happening in Saudi. Uh, and I'll give the chance to mm -hmm. the next panelist to Thank talk you, about Jeff. their side. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't mind going next. Um, you know, growing up in the US and, you know, being an American, you kind of have a different definition of what is culture in the US, right? I think we have the privilege of choosing whichever culture we might have come from or who we associate with, right? You know, growing up in high school, I might have had a lot of Mexican friends, so I might have taken some from their culture. Uh, so, you know, in the US, we have that privilege of, of really having multiple cultures, but we do have a societal norm in, in the US, which is quite unique. Uh, one of the bigger things that I notice is more or less the degree of the family involvement between, let's say, the U.S. and in Greece. So most of my, let's say, more of Americanized friends, uh, you know, you're 18, go off to college, go do your thing. And then in Greek culture, you know, you're maybe still very close to your family, even in your mid 30s and 40s. And we have that multi-generational uh, family structure. And, you know, even myself, being an American, uh, you know, I always think, okay, well, what am I going to leave for my kids? Or, you know, I don't even have kids right now, but eventually how do we, you know, what is the generational uh, uh, thing we're going to offer them? And I think really that has helped this country with 14 years of economic crisis. You know, Greece lost 30% of GDP in 2010 and is still living through that. And you see uh, that in a lot of everyday families, but because, you know, let's say the kids move in with the grandparents or the grandparents help take care of the grandkids while the parents are away and that family unity really does help. And it's important, you know, I, some of my best friends are my second and third cousins, which in the U.S., most of my friends didn't even know their first cousins. Uh, and so just that extension of cousins and family and, and knowing that you might have the support system is, is something it's not universally Greek because I see a lot of head shaking, uh, you know, when we talk about the family dynamic, but, you know, it's something that I think is very special, uh, at least in, I would say in the Eastern Mediterranean, because for the most part, we're all pretty similar, uh, you know, on the Eastern side of the Mediterranean. Thank you so much, Pete. Yeah, can I go then? 
Yes, of course. Yeah, um, when I think of culture, it was too broad for me to explain about Korean culture. So I think better I specify as an example and so on. So, so um, uh, basically, so according to our history, our country has been had been called as uh, Eastern Kingdom of Courtesy. So polite, impolite matters are very important. So when you are impolite, then everything will be gone, even though you have a uh, fact and reality. But polite, impolite matter uh, uh, include everything. So, but uh, this is a transaction figure. So the young generation, they they do I mean, matter the courtesy, courtesy. So they say what they want to say. But anyway, that's the basic of Korean culture. And uh, 24 hour culture, I think, yeah, maybe I want to specify that uh, 24 hour culture, restaurant, PC room, spa, or mart, or beverage store. So everywhere you can see 24 hour uh, mart and, and stores. Uh, it based on the safety in our country. So every we can find that uh, 24 hours, uh, the, the shop and, and thing. And then also very quick, very quick. Uh, I wonder why the people uh, line up for three hours and four hours and, and the, the DMV when I come to the United States. In our country, even you don't need to wait more than five, five, five minutes in the uh, DMV or uh, airport, airport. Uh, processing less than five minutes. So we are we are not uh, familiar to waiting to wait like uh, one hour, two hours. That's not so very quick and quick. Uh, even we deliver everything now in in uh, United States, we deliver like pizza and so on. But like fifty years ago, we deliver everything. Even you can deliver food at the park or beach. You can order the food and they deliver you like uh, 10 minutes and 15 minutes. So that's the quick, quick. And um, everything is quick. When I come to the United States, I order like an internet system that I had uh, waited for like uh, two weeks, but not in Korea, like uh, tomorrow or today, this afternoon or tomorrow. And we have out of order of the internet and I call and we need to wait here like a few days, right? Up to, the technician come comes to to repair, but if the technician doesn't come today, this afternoon, we order we quit we uh, cancel the internet and then we, we order the next one. So that's that's the culture in in South Korea. So uh, and also um, custom oriented, custom oriented. All the the public offices as a service provider. So every uh, office, public office, you can see the picture of the officer and name of the officer. And when you feel uncomfortable on certain person, you just write a paper on that and then put in a box. Then the, the government will treat the officer. So uh, everything is customer oriented. And also we have passion on education education, so much passion on education. So the birth rate is at 0 0.76 per, per uh, I mean, the couple, because we don't to provide uh, the budget for the education, child education. So that's the user uh, culture and also public-based society, public-based society. So public bathroom, that's very unusual to, to Westerners, right? When you come to South Korea, you, you can take a bath with other people in a public public uh, bathroom. So public-based uh, society. And also we need to ask question to Dr. Reina, how old are you? <laughs> that's very easy. So that's what, what I think uh, difference between the two countries. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting and very specific <laughs> uh, point. Yeah, uh, and I um, you can ask, and it's all good to ask the age actually, so you know to be polite or use the honorable forms or or not. Yeah, all right, Dr. Haniya. 
Yeah, sure. So very interesting uh, responses. I was just uh, really uh, happy to hear all of these responses because some of these responses are actually relevant to my experience. Um, I grew up in Palestine uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's kind of like yeah, sharing some uh, uh, experiences with Shaza and peace and grief. So for me, when I look at cultures and have like similar and different, I look at like uh, different aspects. So, you know, I remember like uh, the school house, like, you know, my school experience is different than my kids experience. I look at um, also the social lives house, like similar and different. I look at uh, different aspects in you know in society that is really impacted us also economic and Baltic relationship and all of these different kind of things. So for me, what what I remember from uh, my school experience uh, in my country is like the school is like really overcrowded with different like children in the classroom. I was uh, also uh, you know the computer lab. It was like really uh, we had like very very old devices for students to learn uh we have like less opportunities to engage uh in education uh less resources and also a uh, very uh restricted time frame so in the school i used to go to it uh it was a un uh, school so it was operated by the united nation and it was like kind of has like three different shifts so we have like morning shifts, noon shifts, and afternoon shifts. So it just <laughs> like all the day, like we have like divide the school system across uh, these uh, three different um, shifts. So um, yeah, I mean, so one of the things here, like it's really impacted me, and you know, let me focus more in education. My experience in the school, so it was like really very crowded, less resources. And I was always thinking, how can like I help? What can I do when I grow up? You know, how can I uh, innovate education while also make it more accessible and uh, for everyone, whatever they are. So this is, you know, one of the experience I uh, had, and I feel here like you know, no matter what, like you know, the classroom still in here. We don't have like two school shifts, or at least like in you know most of uh, the places. And another thing is when I think also about social life. Yeah, so for me, when uh, I grew up, uh, you know, there there was like people coming and go, people come and go all the time. So I I don't feel like uh, I you know always have some people come and go. Uh, and uh, like Pete said, like we have like this family relationship, it's very important to us. So for me, it was like a uh, family relation, relatives come and go anytime. So I feel having this kind of like, you know, social support is very important. So when I came here, it, I feel like I was kind of shocked at the beginning because I, I don't see any relatives, any people, any friends. Um, so it was a kind of hard and still hard for my kids, like growing up here. Um, so these are kind of like in general. So uh, looking at leadership styles. So leadership styles in my country, or maybe it's this is something different for another question, but also like there is variation. Some of like, you know, leaders are like, you know, like I, I visualize this based on my experience in the school, like how the teachers is like, you know, instructing the students and telling them like, you know, and then the students like, this is, you know, what we should learn and then the students repeat and so on, this kind of, you know, traditional style. But also there are different types of learning that really uh, impacted me and allowed me like, you know, to, you know, to love education and exploring why not everyone doing uh, something innovative, something different, something engaging. So, um, yeah, that's in general. And also, yeah, for marketing, I mean, economy and things like that is uh, also uh, sunk. Am I saying it though? Having difficulty saying your name. 
Python. So, um, yeah, I mean, in my countries, if you want to do any uh, things, if you want to like apply for a uh, passport or anything, it takes like uh, time, but here everything is digitalized, you know, everything you can call, submit online, order online. So it's, uh, it's easier than uh, over there in my countries. Yeah, so I don't want to continue more, but. Thank you, Dr. Hania. It's amazing to listen to all different perspectives and you know different cultures. We do have a few more questions. <laughs> so I will kindly ask everyone to talk probably for two minutes so we can, I can cover a few more questions uh, for the next few rounds. Um, but next one, I want to talk about leaders uh, between US uh, and uh, a different culture that you lived in. So what are some culture, uh, not culture, some um, differences and similarities that you perceive uh, between the leaders in your country and in the US? Who wants to start? Shada? Um, all right. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, like, uh, there's a very big difference in terms of, of leadership, I would say, but I will, on the top of them, I would say um, the youthfulness. Um, as you know, right now is um, the Saudi is ruled by the uh, um, King uh, Salman bin Abdulaziz and his crown prince is the Mohammed bin Salman, AKA MBS. Um, his youthfulness is often associated with the progress of uh, attitude um, and ideas, um, which is I feel is 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 important when you understand the the transformation that Saudi is going through. So um, over the years, or kind of, when I was kind of young, that we were very used to kind of like the the uh, the more kind of uh, mature or old kind of kind of leadership, but what we've seen in the last ten years, there's a shift, especially in Saudi, in terms of um, how leadership uh, is uh, kind of uh, presented. So um, this has really much resonated with the young populations of Saudi and other countries. Um, I know that could be debatable, but. Um, historically, Saudi is dependent on oil. Uh, the leadership vision uh, came with this kind of idea of de the diversification of kind of um, uh, the economy with new initiatives. These ideas come from a very young, very kind of youthful and a visionary kind of uh, uh, mindset. Uh, and this is what I can say about the, the Saudi leadership at the moment. Um, some of these, uh, I, I mean, we're I, I'm gonna talk specifically on uh, going back to the youth and why is this is important. Um, when a leadership is, is, is talking about the future, it's very different when people go back to the kind of like the amendment or the kind of the founding fathers. So now when I, I if I, I was when I kind of see this question, I see it in how you approach leadership from a kind of forward thinking perspective. So you will find Saudi all the way the Saudi leadership now is very focused on what's going to happen in the future. You, re, you will not see this discussion where people are trying to debate and discuss previous history. So there's um, the leadership right now is focused on a unification of vision, um, a kind of uh, centered around this, let's say this 2030 vision that was created uh, a couple of years ago. I think this is, we're going through this eight years of this uh, kind of vision. And if you, this kind of uh, unified the language and kind of perspective of everybody who talks about Saudi, being if it's a governmental, non-governmental, commercial, even in school, kids, when they talk with each other, they now have kind of a common, uh, uh, let's say, dialogue about where they see themselves. And this is the power of leadership. This is the impact of leadership. And this is what I can say that distinguish what's going on right now is the ability that that kind of power and leadership can affect 
the younger generation and the way they approach kind of um, their uh, their future. Um, like if you talk now to kids in the school is like, um, yeah, I'm doing, for example, this, uh, this sports uh, and hopefully, and this kind of relates to this part of the vision. And I'm gonna, I see myself at that part working in this kind of uh, um, uh, industry or kind of, I'm gonna be more involved in sport because in Vision 2030, we are supposed to reach this kind of level of sport. And this is where I see, this is how people embed themselves within that vision. So I think that the strength of this kind of um, uh, style is the ability for the individual to see themselves within that kind of leadership. Um, you, um, it's a bit of a different where you feel like um, it's kind of, um, uh, this is the, let's, it's, it, I mean, it's not only the idea of being centralized, but also the involvement of the people is very important. And this is what we see the big shift and change. Um, um, I want to add to, uh, in terms of leadership, like the Crown Prince, for example, implemented several social reforms to improve the human rights, for example, the freedom of the young generation. And this is very important when we talk of also about this leadership th that um, resurfaced recently. Um, um, women are now in the forefront in terms of uh, getting their uh, of rights and involvement and inclusion. And we're not talking about these superficial kind of wishy-washy kind of solution where you kind of tick the numbers within a committee just to add a woman. It uh, it's, it's, it's very important to go look at these numbers in terms of also effectiveness. Are they in the leadership? Are they taking a leadership role? Are they taking a more senior? involved, uh, are they really involved in these decision making? Um, when I started, for example, working, uh, it, this was not part, this was before all of these reforms, but I would say in terms of empowerment, there was always empowerment in, in terms of freedom and support uh, that, uh, and how that support looks like, this is what have changed today. So, um, Although there is a mix of culture, religion, and kind of also um, future kind of uh, targets that we wanna reach, this kind of leadership came, this new mindset, able to kind of blend these, all of these kind of aspects and all of these kind of uh, 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 point of views into kind of a single kind of view where in the end, we're in it together, we have to progress together. Um, and just to give you an example, like I was in Saudi uh, uh, last month, um, and I'm just amazed how these young generation so feels so empowered and, and happy. Like you can see people's, like if you go and see those 13, 14 year old kids, they all have the pictures of the of the leaders. This this is not something that common you see. Like when I was growing up, are people putting the, the pictures on their cars or when kind of a celebration comes, you see the people very involved versus kind of having it more uh, like a, a, a very casual kind of event you'll see them extremely happy and being very kind of proud of what they contributed in terms of their accomplishment or what opportunities that opened up for them. Um, um, one of the things that really kind of um, inspires me as well, like last uh, week, we had the Sa first Saudi, the first, let's say, Arab woman to, uh, to go to space. And she was Saudi and she came from Saudi. And this is kind of shows you how this um, reform has changed uh, kind of the position of how we view people and human rights and how to how we are serious, for example, to be in the forefront of develop, developed nations. It's no longer being in a, a playground where you compete. The, the vision that the leadership came up with is about excelling, leading, and being uh, a catalyst for change and reform. 
Um, it's not, I, I, I can see how it's not been easy, but it's working and it's happening. And, and I think if you go and just see from the moment from 2016, for example, until, until today, you can see kind of the little kind of fruits that started kind of to grow and you can see it. It's still a long term, it's, it's still a long vision. It's still a, a very long road to go through, but um, it's something. It's something that I can see um, that has unified the country versus being a, um, versus the this old kind of uh, mentality of being kind of tribal and everybody to its own and being part of the small community that you have kind of the loyalty to. Now it's more about uh, working together, integrating all of these differences or just finding the commonality. Uh, and working towards uh, the better kind of, I know it kind of sounds a little bit, uh, uh, can be cliche, but it's actually, this is kind of the, the new kind of spirit of Saudi that's happening today. And as a country, it's, you'll be very surprised in terms of how, from a leadership perspective, the, the, the knowledge um, of how important technology that will change the, uh, how will technology change kind of uh, people and future and how we move forward. Um, so you can see that I, I always tell people, it's a very techie country. The infrastructure is very, you everything can be kind of done with a click of a button. But I think uh, I'll stop here and give somebody else a chance, okay. Thank you so much, Shada. You make me want to sign up for the next international trip to Saudi. <laughs> Maybe we'll of request course, a special K-12 tour there to, to learn more about the young generation as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, who would like to go next? Same question. The, uh, what similarities and differences do you perceive between leaders uh, between U.S. and uh, your country? Yeah, then, uh, mm -hmm. Johnson? Uh, in terms of uh, the country leader, like a president of South Korea, I don't want to say about him because uh, we, the people in South Korea, are really negative on him. His uh, presidentship and his directions or strategies moving the country, uh, especially between the big countries like uh, China and then. Uh, Russia and Japan and the United States. So uh, mostly we, we Korean people don't like uh, his strategy and his position. So I think it's, the time is coming to uh, impeach him again. <laughs> so uh, generally, I want to say about the leaders in our country, the uh, society. Uh, as you know, the Korean society is based on the hierarchical structure, which comes from the Confucianism from China for long, like a thousand years ago. So leadership is only the position, which means uh, the leaders do not need to respect the characteristics or personalities of the members, just to do not need to persuade, but top down order to the members. That's the leaders in, in South Korea, typically. And leaders have the controlling power and also members listen to the order and follow the order. It seems that the task-oriented leadership uh, prevailing in, in, in our country. So if you have a productive product and result, you are a good leader. If not, <laughs> you're not a good leader. So, so that, that is very different from the, what we see the leadership or leader in, in the United States. So this is the transaction period. So we try to change the, the concept of the leadership in Korea, but still, still that's the, the basic concept of uh, leadership in South Korea. Similarly, maybe the leaders in Korea and the United States, they both concerning their personal inter interest, even though they are working for public. So that might be the similarity too. Thank you. Thank you, byung uh, I can go, I can go next or yeah so thank you uh for sharing your opinions and uh, about leadership and how it looks similar and different 
So um, I also have kind of like similar uh, ideas, but for me also when I think of leadership, I think of like, I feel like each one of us uh, is a leader in some way. Like, um, uh, my daughter, she wants to say hi. Hi, so Nadine is leader, for example, because she makes the decision that she needs to finish her homework on time and she needs to have like a specific time to play. So I think each of us has, a, a, like, you know, a sense of leadership because leadership is more about like uh, making decisions. Uh, being responsible, having uh, being accountable of the things that they want to do, uh, guided by uh, someone uh, like maybe a uh, more facilitator, could be like a parent, because uh, a mom or a dad can be a leader in their homes, how they uh, manage uh, the relationship with their children. Uh, also, beyond that, the school teacher. Uh, the you know the principal in a school. So each one of these experiences that uh, the students or like you know all of us has been involved in from uh, whether we've been like in different cultures or me being in different cultures, the way how I view people making decisions, uh, deciding on different things and how they manage different responsibilities uh, have impacted me in some way. So and I think here we should like shift the way how we look at leadership, but by like maybe as mentioned as Shaza mentioned earlier, like allowing youth and uh, young generation to understand that there is the leadership inside each one of us, and then build on these skills of decision making, problem solving to uh, help them to be a leaders and share opinions with others. So, and then uh, having like, you know, so they can believe more in themselves and value themselves the most. So uh, for me, these are, you know, in my country, I have, I have observed different types of like, as uh, by songs mentioned, uh, like we ha I have observed different kind of leadership. So those who are like, you know, authoritative, just kind of like do and as I tell, or just my way or that way. <laughs> Others who can like tell you, like no, I, I value your decision, your thoughts and why do you think so? And why not try and making mistakes and all of these kind of things. So I, for me, I what really, I liked and appreciated the most uh, this uh, ideas of openness, like being open to different ideas, different perspectives, uh, sharing uh, thoughts, and uh, believing in each one, uh, believing in each one in like the institution, whether that you know home, whether that like you know school, classroom, or the society at large within the culture or a different culture. Um, so yeah, so some of the things like really overlap between what I have observed there here. So there are different styles uh, that, you know, you can see it and there are differences that exist within like family, within the culture, within uh, the region. So uh, yeah, so I feel like there are more kind of differences and um, yeah, within the region. But again, like for me, I feel uh, leadership, it's uh, a big term, a big umbrella that each, I mean, one of us can be a leader in some way. Thank you, Dr. Hania. Uh, Pete, would you like to respond to this question also? Yeah, of course. So Greece is a relatively small country, 10 million people that actually live in the country. and so. We don't have that privilege as the U.S. would have, you know, 10,000 employees. You know, most companies are one, two, three, four family run businesses. Uh, you know, a mid sized company is five to 10 and a large company would be over 12. Uh, so, you know, just to kind of have the perspective of what would be an organization. And then we also have to keep in mind that Greece has been suffering an economic crisis for the last 14 years. So when I heard the question, I also think about the relationship between leader and follower. So what does that mean for Greece? 30% unemployment for quite a while. 
that meant a lot of people weren't getting paid. That meant a lot of people were working and not actually getting salary for it. That means the employer had a lot of privilege or I guess power to be able to just say, okay, quit. There's thousands of people looking for work. And now that's changed, right? Greece is the most, the best performing country in the Eurozone in the last two years. And we are expected to have double GDP growth in any other country. So you do see that shifting a little bit, but what does that mean for, uh, for being a leader, right? Now, those tactics that you might've had, let's say 10 years ago, where you're more of an authoritarian, more dictating, more of that family style, because a lot of the bigger businesses were just family business that grew. Well, that doesn't really work for, for the youth in Greece anymore because they know that they might have better options. You know, They can go to Europe uh, and other parts of the world as well. And so that's really one of the differences that I see in leadership here is that the concepts that we're all talking about are relatively new. And I teach a course in leadership uh, for the MBA students at my college. And them just even thinking about having different approaches and, and analyzing situations and, and having a more of a human approach to how you motivate is, is great because you see this younger generation and they say, well, that's not how my boss treats me. And I go, well, you're all MBA students. I have a pretty confident you know, perception that some of you or not all of you will keep moving up in your careers. So when does this stop? Right. So this will stop with your generation. And so uh, and also if we look at Greece's history, you know, my parents were third grade educated orange farmers. Uh, you know, Athens wasn't even really a city 120 years ago. You know, most Greek cities were within the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul, Izmir, Trapezunda. Uh, Greece was just a bunch of villages. And so the economic jump happened quickly. Athens 100 years ago didn't even really, it was, let's say, a third of the size, if not. And so most Greeks come from either villages or refugees from the Ottoman Empire. And this shift is, we're a new country. It was just basically agriculture before uh, this now privilege that we have of having the beaches and having resorts and all these types of things. So it's growing our society into uh, being able to leave our villages, in other words. Thank you. Um, you know, we talk about the cultures, differences, similarities between U.S. and other countries and leaderships, right? And as everyone was talking, I was thinking, you know, um, U.S. does a lot of leadership studies, right? Um, probably, I don't know, 10 times or uh, how many times more than other countries? Uh, and one of the reasons can be the culture, uh, well, it must be culture related, but I'm just thinking like, for example, compare Asian cultures, the more um, almost like submissive uh, mentality in work situation, the hierarchical structure that Johnson was talking about. And versus in the US, the, you know, individualization, and we advocate, right, for, and we have a union. In China, we have union too, but they don't really advocate for workers. So because of all the infrastructure of the culture, uh, then that's why like we have to study leadership because you cannot per se control your employees because we are very individualized uh, citizens in the US. And I just found that's very interesting um, between China, uh, US and other cultures. So we are going to move to the next question. Uh, it's a global leadership. So we talk about culture and leaders in general, but now, as global leaders, uh, what do you think, um, uh, based on your international, multiple international experience that, that you might have, so what would you like to say to a global leader? What would you recommend them? Um, any suggestions for people who would consider themselves as global leaders or any other uh, global leaders that you, per, uh, you see right now? I can answer that. Uh, you know, I think to be a, a global leader, you have to be a, a fan of history. I, I can't go into a country and, and work in that environment without having some sort of historical uh, curiosity to, to how the people got to how they are. You know, in the U.S., we have that kind of 
I even have that when I came here to Greece and I saw a lot of inefficiencies and I wanted to fix things and and I had to take a step back and say, well, why are people working in this specific way? What are the historical situation that led us down this path? And and how does let's say religion play into into what we're doing? How does family tie? How does everything? And so, you know, I think to be a good global leader, you have a have to have a high acumen of history, psychology economics and uh what else just business acumen i guess but i think you know history and psychology uh, are two of the biggest and most important things when it comes to being a global leader thank you pete that's very well said and shut that um that's um uh that's very interesting as you as you were talking uh, i'm playing in my head this idea about uh, playing with nationalism and globalization. I think, uh, especially when you have, um, like we talked about like the Middle East and kind of the Mediterranean style of being very kind of uh, family oriented, uh, people kind of rely on each other, you know? Um, there's a, I, I had this dis discussion that um, being an entrepreneur in a, in a community uh, in a in a small community versus kind of a global community uh, or being an entrepreneur, for example, in, in the US versus kind of Saudi where you have like, or for or maybe for the Middle East or in China where you actually the farm or being a farmer where everybody is a you know is a farmer versus anyway. I mean this idea of having this kind of extended relationship or this extended support is very different when you are in a very global context. Um, that means you have to kind of reset your brain into terms of what works uh, locally versus globally, um, uh, which is sometimes using your culture and religion and probably your values, your family values works in some areas of the world versus if you take that somewhere else, it's gonna be more like a fairy tale or kind of a, let's say, a, a, fiction, a, a fiction story that you're trying to implement that will never work, you know what I mean? So I think this savviness that you need to have this kind of both hats where um, think uh, globally, but act locally, wherever you are. Uh, I feel that's, that's a very important, if you wanna approach kind of leadership in general, uh, you need to be able to play this kind of, um, you, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Uh, leaders right now uh, must speak def two or three, four languages. That kind of breath gives you kind of a context in terms of how you implement business and how people think. And, you know, some, some kind of terminologies work in this kind of language versus this language. Sometimes you're trying to find a definition, you'll find it. So I feel it's very, uh, I mean, I will kind of echo, uh, what my colleagues here said, but education definitely, uh, a, a very extensive knowledge of history and people, um, putting yourself there. I think it's very important uh, to be, um, not to be in a place of just uh, observer, but also kind of integrate yourself to see what's going happening on the ground. Um, and, uh, and just to reflect uh, on my experience, um, there's a lot of segregation uh, growing up, having this uh, kind of uh, male-dominated society in Saudi. So there's a lot of uh, times that uh, explaining a situation in a very female-oriented context might not kind of reach that other side, which is the male. And today, when I try to explain our kind of issues that we had, let's say, 20 years ago, nobody understands because they didn't live that context, even if it's, if it's the same society. Um, so that's, that's kind of, uh, my advice in terms of having this, um, this, this global mindset with a local kind of impact. It's very important to move forward, um, in any kind of leadership or managerial roles. Thank you so much, Shada. Yeah, I, I was trying to type, type in the chat box, uh, you know, leadership is evolving too, right? As our culture is also evolving and blending into each other's cultures as well. Um, so uh, who would like to go next? Byung-san, yes. 
Yeah, I've been working in education field in Korea and the Philippines and the United States for more than 20 years. And typically I had a five year experience in the Philippines as an educator or a trainer for young people. And from my international perspectives and experience, I think I can uh, say to the global leaders to concern more about the, the issues of the third countries, especially. For example, there are lots of spots where there's no uh, like a public education system, no electric, no telephone system, no internet. Yeah, so when, when I was in the Philippines, I fly from Manila to a certain island and then use two hours spurs and Tiffany, there's no more transportation than I rode the horse. And if, if I reach up to the hill, there's nothing, but there are a lot of children. So I think uh, uh, global leaders should concern more about the issues, issues of the third countries and in their specific professional areas. I don't know their, their areas, but uh, specific their own uh, uh, areas, they should concern on that the issues of the countries in Africa or any any other countries. That's my, my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Byung-san. And um, I, can go next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can go next. Oh, well, thank you. That's a good question. So yeah, I mean, when I think about the global leaders, as uh, you know, um, some others has mentioned, uh, it's yeah, it's like if you want to go somewhere and you, you should understand uh, the culture, you should understand how people think. So I, I mean, I think of this as as a learning designer, <laughs> the needs assessment for where you need to understand, um, you know, you need to work as uh, kind of like. Uh, researcher, analyze this culture, understand the people that you're going to work with, uh, the employees, what, uh, you know, what really uh, matters to them the most, and how you can uh, make them more active, more engaged, more valued uh, in uh, this specific context or within the relationship that you are, uh, you know, that uh, characterizes a specific uh, relationship in this organization. So, and also be open-minded because sometimes there are some cultural differences that, uh, you know, as a global leader that you are not aware of, or maybe you don't like or something. Uh, so I, I think here, uh, yeah, being open-minded and respect cultural understanding, uh, the, the cultural differences in being, uh, you know, develop more sense of understanding of what they value, for example, how they, uh, you know, what really matters to them the most. It's it's really important. And one of the things, and I I think uh, this couple that is really helpful for this is being active listeners. So sometimes, yeah, this might take time, but just being active listeners having uh, sessions and like going to the culture, understanding, just observing, listening to the people and um, that you will work with and uh, having different sessions and uh, just to allow them to share their thoughts and ideas. And also, um, you know, as the global leaders, things that change in our society. So things that change so fast. And for us as a global leaders, we should be able to adapt at the same pace. So always you need to be uh, an ongoing learners, knowing what's happening and how you can adapt. Different things we hear in the news comes and go, uh, different um, that impact the society, different societies. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for us as a global reader, we should be aware of all what's happening, what's going on in these different cultures and how these uh, situation or how these like unexpected situation might impact uh, the employees, might impact uh, the people that you work with. So uh, 
so that's what one of the things so I, I for me i feel like you have to be always uh investigator <laughs> researcher evaluator open-minded active listeners all of these different kind of things and uh, always try to know what's happening and how you know you can tackle these changes into your own leadership practices uh, and listen, have kind of like a feedback loop and go and feedback to see what works, what doesn't work. It's okay to make mistakes and things doesn't work, but we should build on, you know, what we do and how can we improve on the go. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I heard people talking about very concrete suggestions such as have skills in psychology, have knowledge in history, have language skills, right? Because languages are the windows of cultures. And we talk about act, think globally, act locally, and forward thinking, always thinking about the future, not what has happened. And we also have, you know, um, Dr. Hania mentioned the open mindset and active listening, all those the leadership strategies that are needed, both a leader, but, you know, of course, as a global leader as well. So, uh, so many points that I, everyone mentioned, a very rich conversation. So I'm going to open the, this time for questions. Uh, we have one question from Sulan first. Do you want to ask or do you want me to read the, the question? Yeah, I, I, I can ask yes. because they are kind of the same question. So I can kind of elaborate. So first of all, uh, thank you so much for sharing this experience. I literally took four pages notes from all the knowledge I acquired from you because it's it's kind of a lecture for me, you know, listen to you, all the differences and similarities and cultural aspects. This is the richness of this kind of panel. So um, considering so many different leadership styles, um, I, I, I wonder if there is any tendency trend that might be something uh, that will become maybe a point of convergency for all those leaders in the future. Uh, just to, to give you an example, for example, Sa Shata and Dr. Sama both mentioned about the open mindset to be more useful, more open to different culture uh, in the new leaders. I know that, for example, um, Biansung and Pete mentioned more traditional way in the, you know, in the past, but, you know, in all your example, it seems like in a way you all brought uh, this shifting mindset to a more or human approach or a public good approach in the countries you were in. So, um, even even uh, the ones that are more historical and know as authoritative are kind of shifting this mindset, right? It seems from what I, I learned from you today. Uh, or is it something that also could be a point of convergence, the openness or this shifting to a more hum, human approach or a more public good approach? I would love to, to hear your thoughts because you have so many stories to share. <laughs> Um, I can comment quickly, um, if that's okay. Um, so uh, I think we have to have a, 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 a starting point for any leader to kind of approach anything. It has to, you have to have to understand where you are at this point and where you're going. But any context we're trying to, like um, any question we're trying to solve right now, we want to understand what is, what are we trying to do? what is the what is the end game and are we trying to revive the economy are we trying to change people's uh, i don't know uh, lives are we trying to uh, in, uh, change the culture are we trying to enhance uh, cooperation like these are all the questions the leaders should have and i think we ha you have to give grace to each of these questions to allow it to foster and understand where you can where you can implement these changes. Um, it's also very important to understand that not all changes have to be uh, executed as once. This open mindset is very good, but also in terms of execution, you have to prioritize. Um, not, not, I mean, this is how probably I see it. It's not about uh, necessity sometimes, it's about building on them, on each of these kind of changes. 
sometimes you can um, execute one um, um, despite needing some other priority, but this is what you can work on right now. And this is what can build right now on the other, for example, chain. And I think this is the crucial part of having the sense of knowledge and uh, a sense of uh, understanding what the community wants, what you're trying to achieve. Um, I've seen it, for example, in, uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, when we talk about, for example, Singapore and how they changed their, uh, their economy and they became uh, like the center of the world in terms of commerce and, and trade. You see it, for example, in places like uh, even in UAE, Dubai, like the, how they changed the, their vision, the, their leader as well, how they changed kind of the perspective of a place. I mean, we're talking about a place that it's not even oil dependent. They they kind of revamped the whole country to become the center of, 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 of uh, let's say, tourism and uh, um, tr uh, and uh, uh, airline and transport and tr all of these kind of mindsets is, uh, uh, is is important, let's say, in terms of having this open mindset for, uh, let's say, fostering change. But again, it has to start from somewhere. Um, not everybody has this ability to kind of visualize, but as a leader, you need to kind of value them and understand where they fit in and how they see themselves useful in that situation. They might not experience or understand it now, but as you take them through it, they will see it in the future, how they contributed. And I think this is very cru crucial when we look at leaders. Um, these, some leaders who, who can see something you haven't seen yet, or they can actually imagine what the possibilities are versus your, uh, versus what, somebody is stuck in terms of trying to finish the task of the day. Um, this is where I feel like it's very crucial to kind of um, understand that leadership is different, but it's also crucial for the movement of, 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 of nations, of societies. Uh, trust, I don't think we discussed this, the, 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 the concept of trust in leadership. How do you, I mean, we are in a very, I would say, it, at this point, nothing is can be hidden. Everything is written. Everything, everything is. Uh, you used to kind of wait for the news in the evening to see what's happening. Now you'll probably see the pictures or people posting up something before the news even uh, reached. So this this is also um, uh, a realization that you cannot hide things anymore. You cannot mask things anymore. It has to be uh, brutally kind of transparent at this point of time. Uh, you can't hide things. You have to be very kind of uh, respectful of the global uh, uh, dialogue or the terminology in terms of human rights, in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, global uh, problems like climate change. These are things that you need to be equipped and understanding and accepting for, and you need to be part of it. Uh, what we've seen the last couple of years, especially with all this, uh, um, I mean, coming out of the pandemic, we see that we are in this together. People have to communicate, and like when the when the world stopped, we all felt it. I don't know. I don't care where you are. Everybody, everybody says, felt like the whole idea of movement became. We became paralyzed. We we realized how very dependent we are on each other whether you're in the US or you're in China or you're in the Europe, you know what I mean? So this kind of, uh, this new reality of, of leadership, uh, it's not only, it, it, it must, you, it has to start from somewhere and understanding where we are today and where we wanna be. Thank you, Shada. Thank you. Anyone else would like to uh, respond to Solon's question, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I mean, well said, and I'll just add a little bit. One of the thoughts I have when it comes to leadership is just even having a much more of a situational approach. And you know, in situational leadership, it's about the relationship between the leader and the follower, and how much uh, support or need the follower might need, and and all styles of leadership 
have an aspect of healthy or unhealthy. So even within a delegative type of leadership approach in certain situations, it calls for that. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind as leaders is to understand the follower and the degree of support they might need in order to meet uh, the task at hand. You know, it was spoken about sustainability or, uh, you know, climate change. There's billions of people that don't have food and water, and I'm pretty sure they don't care about recycling plastics when they don't have anything to eat. Uh, so, you know, okay, well, how do we get that? to a specific level of sustainability. That way we could, you know, start attacking climate change differently or, um, you know, people might be disenfranchised by historical situations over the past generation or two. Well, how do we rectify that or at least bring people together? Because one of the things that I got from our panel discussion is that I think we're far more similar than we're different. Uh, and I think that's a human component that we often forget about, uh, the similarities within everything uh, and, and within just people in, in general. And so I think having those types of mindsets, because, you know, I tell this to my students, there's, there's two things in the world. There's control and influence. The degrees of control on someone else is minuscule. Even if I have a gun to your head, I still can't really control you. But uh, I have degrees of influence over you. The only person I can control is myself. And so understanding what your degrees of control and influence are could ideally help you be much more uh, dangerous, I guess, you know, dangerous in a good way. So that's just one thing I wanted to add. Thank you. I like that we are very different, but also very similar in the U.S., you know, we are analyzing what are the difference between us and, you know, your country, but under the U.S. context, everybody is different, right? And in the China context, let's say, everybody's still different. In Pepperdine, everyone's different. In GSCT, everyone's still different. So at the Everyone end, it's, it's the same, it's the same question, like how do we be a leader despite our cultural differences with considering the context, yeah. Yeah, that approach might be a Greek thing. Like mm -hmm. everyone that I know, I try to find the similarities between us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in college, most of my friends were either Balkan or, you know, from the Caucasus because of historical similarities between us or Middle Eastern because of historical similarities between Greeks and, you know, Middle Eastern people. So it could be just a very Greek mentality of trying to find the similarities uh, between between people. but. I, I find it to be very helpful because, you know, it goes into that, you know, maybe even learning parts of somebody's language or whatever it could be just to kind of build that bridge. Yeah, and going back to your situational leadership, it, it's like the other way around, right? It's yeah. still the same, no matter it, how similar we are, still uh, in different situations, uh, different leadership and considerations are still being needed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do we have another question from Marie, Dr. Ma Rami, Dr. Marmontes, and uh, Dr. Green? <laughs> if we do not have any questions, I would uh, ask each panelist to give us like a one liner <laughs> okay so i know that's a big ask it's not easy but maybe two sentences if you cannot do one sentence just to um wrap us off like what what is one thing you would like to say uh um you know based on this session theme uh, regarding global global leadership it can be an encouragement to students at gsep who are learning to be global leaders or uh, you know uh, the audience later on who watched this uh, session that who's either studying about global leadership or already are a global leader uh, in our diverse um, context, you know. Uh, and as I think about global leaders, you know, we are all global leaders because we are living in such a 
there was um, um, a time, you know, like as I say, our culture is blending to each other. And especially in LA, I feel where wherever you go, wherever you work, you work with people from different origins and different cultures. So anything you would like to share regarding to that uh, then, yeah. If you're ready. Yeah, since we are talking about the global, global leaders and culture, I wanna mention about the cultural perspective like Dr. Hanya and many uh, other panelists mentioned about it. And then in the history, some global leaders destroyed the culture of the some part, right? Of the part in the globe. So I think as global leaders, we should respect the cultures of other nations and other other countries. I think that's very important. And, and thank you so much for, for this opportunity giving me participating in this uh, 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 discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, also uh, following up with uh, what my son mentioned, I think when we think of leadership, uh, we should uh, understand and listen to the people uh, themselves who are involved, like, you know, the staff and employees who work uh, with you and or, uh, deal with you in this specific organization, because as we mentioned, there is a variation that exists within the culture, although there are some like uh, generic uh, characteristics that specify specific culture, but there are also, uh, you know, differentiation that exists within a culture. So listen to the people themselves. And sometimes uh, the information in the internet or in the news is misleading. So uh, the best source is the people themselves, listen to the employee, the people within organization. And in addition to this, like, you know, being active and listeners and open-minded, um, having open-minded. And also, I think it's really important to uh, be a role model. So each one of us, like, as a global leaders, be a role model and treat others the way that you would like to be treated. Thinking of yourself, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and think, how would I react if, you know, by this, this so and so. So it's it's really important to live, you know, the vision, see how would you react if you are in such situations. Um, so to think beyond um, what your uh, role and also to think from, uh, you know, the way how these employees thinking, like how they are thinking uh, and what can you do to make them. Uh, more engaged, more active, based on other understanding. Okay, <laughs> my sentence is over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hania. And um, uh, Shata? Well, um, I just want to thank you uh, for including me, uh, Celine, Dr. Wen. I mean, this has been, uh, it's my first kind of a contribution now with Pepperdine, so thank you for including me. Um, um I, I i must say that when you say global leadership it kind of like it, it kind of brings a little bit of fear in my heart when i hear that word and even go, getting into this program but the more i i mean the more we talk and discuss that you know leadership or global leadership is not a privilege it's a responsibility um, we need to start looking at it as now that we are not kind of yeah just be, having this knowledge or having this kind of um, um, platform is actually a responsibility. And I take it, um, I wouldn't say seriously to the point, but I really take it seriously to the point uh, that I'm, uh, I really want to be uh, able to kind of share this knowledge. And uh, just through this experience through Pepperdine and even talking, uh, I would say, especially after the, the pandemic, we started having these open dialogue about connectiveness and uh, sharing and just realizing how much we need each other um, and seeing slowly these kind of divides melting. I mean, it's, it's sometimes for me a very humbling uh, to see even how people kind of uh, people biases, you know, uh, change uh, throughout these discussions. 
So uh, thank you very much for this session and keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I'm here to offer you any support you need. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Shata. All right, um, Pete. So I second that on thank you for inviting me and you know all of us to, to even just to get to meet each other because we're all three I think most of us are all students in the same program but different cohorts and so it's good to connect even in that way um you know one of the I guess my closing thought is is culture is a relationship between you and the societal norms and so the more you interact within that relationship the more immersed you are uh then depending on how much degree of uh influence you receive from that culture or even you put in you, know, you could uh influence the other culture in some way at least to the people in your surrounding and so you know nurture those relationships and and eventually i think we'll all get to like a, a very good place and uh, all i just have to add all of the countries that were represented, Palestine, South Korea, Saudi, and even UAE are places that I've wanted to go. So hopefully I can go and visit you know, those cultures and be a little bit more immersed in them as well. Please Thank do. You so You're much. always welcome. Yeah. And you guys are welcome. <laughs> welcome to Greece, but not this early in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, based on Sulan's notes, probably we'll have a lot of wonderful quotes from all of you uh, panelists. So uh, I just want to thank you all, um, regard, uh, I guess, um, how to say, representing the audience. I want to thank you all and give you a big round of applause virtually. <laughs> thank you for your time, and especially those who are in the early mornings right now. And I will pass the time back to Sulan. Thank you, Dr. Shane. Thank you, everyone, each one of you for being here with us today. Um, I, 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 I do have a lot of quotes, amazing quotes from you all. And um, wow, I, I don't have words to say how um, impressive, I, impressed I am with all the, the things that I learned today. Um, and that's it. I think we can go ahead and close the session for tonight. I'll stop uh, recording.